Good afternoon, Cape Cod, and welcome to the May Day virtual town hall event hosted by the Democratic Socialists of America. As many of you know, today is May Day, and May Day is an international celebration of working class people and labor unions. This day originated in the campaign at the turn of the 20th century to establish the eight hour working day. Today, the PRO Act legislation is one of the most important labor laws for expanding the protection of workers' rights to organize and bargain in the workplace. Passing the PRO Act has interesting connections to the Green New Deal and the climate crisis. In today's town hall, we will be exploring the connections between labor unions and a healthy world, which includes human health, but also environmental health and even animal health. My name is Marilla Batista. I'm a DSA member here in Cape Cod, a Mashpee resident, a Sturgis graduate, and a public health researcher. So if everyone can come in and put in your names, where you're from, uh, your town, your pronouns, and we're going to get started in this chat. So please put any questions you have, uh, any answers you want to give along to our discussion, and we're going to take a peek at the end of what you contributed. And please feel free to engage with others in the chat and keep in conversation respectful, people who make harmful or hurtful comments will be removed. At this time, I'm gonna hand it over to Alan Holt, who is the co-chair of the Cape Cod's Pro Act campaign. And Alan is going to give a bit of background on the Pro Act campaign and its connections to the Green New Deal. Um, and before I hand it over to Alan, I just wanna express my gratitude to Jackie, Sam, Cole, Kate, Austin, and the other DSA members who contributed to this event. So Alan Holt is a writer and an activist born in California. He attended the New School's MFA program for creative writing and fiction, and he teaches workshops to New York City teachers on how to advance their own writing. On the East Coast since 2013, Alan now lives in Falmouth, where he and his wife are in the process of regenerating a plot of land long neglected. Alan will be breaking down the PRO Act and the Green New Deal right after this short video. We are in crisis. Because the planet is in crisis. The environmental disasters that we are facing are not going to stop. And in the face of disaster, we need a proven solution. We, the working class, need to organize. Because everything we have, we want by fighting. During the Great Depression, it was trade unionists and socialists who organized to win the New Deal. During World War II, it was that same labor movement that created the arsenal of democracy and defeated the Nazis. But since then, the labor movement has lost power. Weakened by neoliberal forces who see empowered workers as a threat to their profits. We are in crisis because now the world faces another existential threat. Fossil fuel capitalists and the politicians they own are standing between us and survival, between us and a better world. We need to remember. To remember the history of our movement. And to restore its power. It's time to pass the PRO Act. To strengthen unions and put power back into the hands of the American worker. To build the movement strong enough to once again defeat the forces that threaten us and to ensure our survival. By winning a Green New Deal and creating millions of good union jobs. We, the working class, are in crisis. And we will meet it like we always have, by fighting together. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Tonight, we have put together a panel of folks who are here to speak on what is probably the two largest issues of the moment, which is organized labor and climate change. Our hope is that you'll come away illuminated, specifically illuminated on the linkage between these two issues. It has been postulated that neither the strengthening of the labor movement nor the adoption of the Green New Deal is possible without the success of the other, that only combined can these two groups of policy decisions have a hope of undoing the very damage that has imperiled the world. In other words, we support one to bolster the other, we get both of them passed, so we have the tools to affect the change necessary to keep this planet alive. Our goal is nothing short of ending poverty, 
in establishing a healthy planet for everyone. Let's start with the PRO Act. Since the passing of the Taft-Hartley Act in 1947 and picking up by the mid 1960s, American unions have had their power systematically eroded. This process was turbocharged in the 1980s with Ronald Reagan and his stated war on the working class. Next, si next slide, please, Sam. Since then, we have had no relief, no chance to undo the damage that has been inflicted upon us by organi upon organized labor. The PRO Act would assist us in turning back the victories of global capital, not the least of which is by weakening the right to work laws that are currently on the books in 27 states. While no piece of legislation is perfect, the PRO Act would be a massive boon to our efforts to unionize America's workforce. It would lend more power and more legitimacy to labor's continued efforts to advocate for its membership and help protect them from corporate retribution. It is not a solution in and of itself, but it is a step. Next slide, please. Why do we need such legis legislation, you may ask? Because it helps address one of the largest problems we have societally, income inequality. It is a well-known economic reality that rising income inequality has gone hand in hand with the weakening of organized labor. In fact, it is precisely in global capital's interest to drive the price of labor as low as possible to maximize their own profits. This has led to a shameful segment of America's workforce being left out of all chances for prosperity. One needs only to look at the growth of corporate profits and executive pay in the post-2008 economy to see the results of the systematic grinding down of working conditions, compensation, and protections. And of course, these losses fall disproportionately on immigrants, women, and people of color. Without the effective force to fight back against capital's interests, they, they are given the green light, both governmentally and culturally, to run roughshod over all concerns but their own bottom lines. Any wishing that they may be good corporate citizens or do the right thing for their workers is to ignore 200 years of labor history. They do not hand out slices of their profits for the generosity, from the generosity of their hearts. They concede those slices after bitter fights with the very workers who make their business models possible. The PRO Act will put additional tools in the hands of labor some of those tools being the very ones declared illegal via the Taft-Hartley Act. Next slide, please. The growth of global, global capitalism is the growth of the extraction of fossil fuels. The burning of stored carbon has been a direct marker to an economy's size, power, and development. As we continue into the second decade of the 21st century, we are finding ourselves at a crossroads. The earth is saying no, and we have no experience, no model for modern economic growth without carbon. Take away the coal, the gasoline, the plastics, the electricity, and we are pushed into models of being we can't quite imagine. This is why decoupling carbon from the global economy has become a hot issue for governments the world over. We must transition, we must innovate, we must experiment with solutions, both technological and societal. This is a moment for massive change. We must push for that change to be as far reaching and transformative as possible. Next slide, please. The Green New Deal cannot reach its full potential without a strong labor movement. It could be argued that it will not even become policy without the strong labor movement. Jobs will be created as the econ economy is overhauled. We have a massive labor pool in this country with workers ready at all skill levels. It is our responsibility to see that these jobs that are offered are as safe as possible, as well paid as possible, as protected as possible. That the wealth that is created by the transition away from carbon does not go upwards, all to the corporate coffers and the hands of the capitalist class. Whether we realize it or not, the fight to keep green energy from becoming, we have to fight to keep green energy from becoming another corporate bonanza. And I use that word purposely because we cannot allow the societal and infrastructure changes that must take place to become another Wild West boomtown of corporate exploitation. They are not coming into our towns, our communities, taking what they want and leaving as they will, not this time. And the best defense against such exploitation? Strong organized labor movements in our communities. Next slide, please. Now, historically, organized labor and environmentalists have not seen eye to eye. In fact, they have very often been at each other's throats. With our increasing knowledge on the mechanisms of global climate change and the accumulated data on the effects of said climate change, we have an opportunity to forge an alliance to shift the national balance of power. 
the planet has had enough. We can spin it however we want. We can argue about timelines and details. We can quibble over solutions, but the massive acceleration of atmospheric carbon is not waiting for us to come to any conclusions. The planet is warming and we are the ones who will suffer and not sometime in the future, but right now. Deep down, we all know these conversations should have begun 40, should have begun 40 years ago. We have lost decades of precious time. So if we don't start pushing now and pushing hard, we will not have a chance to try again in 2050. It has been postulated that there is no way for the planet to support the entire population of the earth at 21st century American levels of consumption. That fundamentally, the ways that we interact with resources like food and fuel in the natural environment will have to change. The best ways for us to absorb these changes is to forge partnerships, to build communities, to forge understandings and design assistance networks. We must also demand that America give back some of its national treasure and that it turn over some of its decision-making power back to the hands of the people, us, those most at risk from climate disruption. Let's start forging these bonds tonight, right now, with this panel. And with that, I turn it back over Morello. Thank you, Alan, for your presentation. Um, I There were some really powerful take, take away from it. Um, the graph that you showed, I think, was a really important one where the where you, sh where you showed that the as unit membership went down, wages stayed the same, but productivity and the work that was demanded from laborers went up. So just showing the importance of unions there. And in with regards to the connection between uh, the, the climate crisis and, and unions, you know, they're both intimately related, connected by predatory capitalism, which affects you know, how both, both the humans and the earth can th sort of thrive and survive. And so now I wanna just take some time to introduce our star-studded panel. Um, we have some really amazing individuals who are examples of strong leaders and strong organizers. So we have a lot to learn from their experiences and contributions. So our first panelist is Chris Powicki, who serves on the executive committee of Sierra Club's Cape Cod Group and the Massachusetts chapter. He lives in Brewster and is an independent energy consultant, adjunct professor at Cape Cod Community College and president of Cape Cod Theater Company and the Harwich Junior Theater and longtime energy and environmental advocate. Our next panelist is Lisa Shu, who is an organizer for the United All Workers for Democracy, which is a rank and file caucus of workers in the United Auto Workers Union who are organizing to win a union wide referendum this fall on switching to direct elections of top union leaders. She was previously a member of and organizer of UAW 5118. And in the Boston DSA chapter, she is co-chair of the Labor Working Group and a leader in the Afro-Socialist and Socialist of Color Caucus. Sorry. And our last panelist, and not the least, is Johanna Strauss, who's an organizer with the SEIU Service Employees International Union Local 888 and a statewide labor union of more than 8,000 mostly public sector workers. Previously, he organized service workers at Santa Clara and Stanford University. He started fighting in the labor movement as a rank and file member of United Auto Workers 2322 while a student worker at UMass Amherst. So now we're going to jump straight into the questions for our discussion. If, uh, if you want to mind skipping to the next slide. So panelists, uh, feel free to tell us a little bit more about yourself while answering the first question. And for our audience, please feel free to answer along or ask questions in the chat throughout. We're gonna take a peek at them later in the event. So the first question is, labor unions have always fought to improve the work and lives of people. In your experience, how have you seen labor unions improve human health? And I'm gonna switch it over to Lisa first. Lisa, um, welcome and thank you for participating. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so I um, was trying to think about this question in like a very comprehensive way. And I think, you know, the most popular conception of unions is that they fight for their own members, which is absolutely true. Um, at the Harvard Graduate Students Union, um, 
aka UW 5118. Um, you know, we're still fighting for uh, healthcare improvements. Um, we still don't really have dental or vision, which other grad workers around the country are on strike for now. Um, but it is the case that whenever unions fight for their own members, they're really fighting for the whole working class because um, all of these improvements in health and safety um, and in, in healthcare um, and other wages and benefits um, put upward pressure on the working condition um, of, of all people. Um, so secondly though, um, met, uh, some of the best and most progressive unions also do what's called bargaining for the common good. Um, so, you know, it's educators fighting for policies that improve the lives of their students. Um, we've seen some incredible wins, um, you know, as, you know, in uh, various um, teachers unions where, uh, you know, uh, they've they've really won a lot of resources for students in their schools, and um, you know we see that now at the nurses' strike in, in Worcester as well, um, fighting for um, safe uh, uh, patient uh, nurse staffing ratios. Um, and then lastly, you know, um, labor unions um, can just are just really powerful. We can just, you know, we we can base you know basically fight for whatever we put our our minds to. And we've seen like with Unite Here and other unions actually like basically um, with their ground game winning the elections um, in in Georgia. Um, we see the MNA putting resources into fighting for for Medicare for all. Um, and so you know when when unions back, you know, um, progressive policies. Um, you know that's that really gives us a fighting chance. So that's sort of my my uh, my little essay on on that. Thank you, thank you. That was really great. Um, it sounds like you know the investment that unions make in the health of their workers could also has effect beyond the workers themselves. You know, when students are healthy, when workers are healthy, um, they can you know they're better able to sustain their families and themselves. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to Chris. Chris, thank you so much for participating today. Thanks very much for having me. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about my, my history briefly. Um, I have been a uh, card carrying member of a union. Back when I was in college, um, I worked as a, uh, as a uh, summer um, jobber at Continental Bakeries, which was the Wonder Bread Bakery in Natick. Um, and um, I would say that the conditions working there were challenging, but I had a, a very personal experience in that I started at the absolute bottom of the rung. And my job was to transfer the um, heated pans leaving the oven onto the conveyor belt that would um, subsequently have dough placed on it to make its route back all the way through the um, conveyor system. And when I started this position, again, I was on the lowest end and I was told that the union had been fighting to eliminate my position forever because of its safety hazards. We were given at the start of each shift very thin flimsy cotton gloves with the idea that if we moved fast enough and didn't hold the pans um, as they went from one conveyor belt to the other, uh, we wouldn't get burned. And um, what happened was ultimately during my second year that position was eliminated um, but the job was not eliminated. It was restructured to put the, um, the workers in another position um, that was a safer position as they automated the, the transfer of these ridiculous pans from one state to another. So my health was actually improved as a union worker. Bigger picture, um, in the last uh, year, Sierra Club uh, employees have actually unionized and it was done for two pur purposes. Number one, um, obviously to improve bargaining rights within the structure of the organization, uh, but also to uh, become part of the um, union community with the idea mm -hmm. that if uh, environmental laborers and, and workers uh, advocates were also uh, in solidarity with workers in other fields, um, we could work together from a common sense of purpose. And um, I, I think that this uh, change within Sierra Club structure is a really important one. It's a commitment um, from Sierra Club to its workers and to the solidarity of workers and protecting the environment. And uh, Sierra has worked uh, across the country with the goal of um, helping support unions in their fight against uh, corporate polluters, uh, both to protect worker health and also the communities in which workers live. Um, and so I see 
um, that intersectionality is really important uh, for environmental advocates to come together with labor advocates, not just to improve working conditions in a factory or in another location, but also to um, raise up the standards uh, as we green up our economy, um, the, the pollution burdens are decreased and that increases everybody's health. Um, so that's just a couple examples I wanted to uh, speak to at the beginning here. Um, I see that this um, connection between the environmental movement and the uh, labor movement has had fantastic success overseas um, and that we have lessons to learn there, but also we have a lot of work to do in building these connections and strengthening them. And I'm, I'm very encouraged by not just the Green New Deal, but um, some of the policies uh, that um, have been enacted recently in Massachusetts uh, and the American Jobs Plan and its commitment to union workers. Um, I think that uh, that's an infrastructure plan that is all about addressing climate change, but the, the goal of having um, the labor movement integral to that transition of our energy system instead of uh, corporations driving the bus, uh, I think is really uh, going to be important in, in lifting up everybody. Thank you so much. Um, you, you definitely hit on a really interesting point that the history of occupational safety movement is a history of the union movement as well. Um, and those, inter those interacted quite a lot. And it definitely builds on what Lisa was talking about that unions are very powerful. And then when they align with progressive policies, there really is an opportunity to raise standards beyond just the working conditions for the workers of that, uh, the members of that union. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Johannes. Thank you so much for participating and welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm calling in from Mashpee today and um, it's great to be here with my uh, fellow panelists and to thanks to the organizers of this event. Um, yeah, this is a key question and, and it's so broad that it, I, I love that what Lisa and Chris already said, you know, raising the floor for uh, across the industries uh, and across for all workers. Um, and then Chris's point about uh, kind of keeping us from getting sick or injured in the first place, uh, I think is, is, a, is a key one. And, and, um, and to add to, um, you know, occupational safety and health, um, you know, you could add breaks is something that is, is a product of the labor movement. Um, the, the weekend, the uh, uh, an eight hour workday, sort of, uh, although we've, we've been regressing for, for a long time on that. Uh, workers' compensation is another thing that the labor movement fought and won. Um, so to make sure that employers, um, uh, all of these uh, things, if you know, if their worker, if their the workers' compensation is really expensive um, because they're unsafe, uh, it, it's, a, it's it's an incentive for them to make their workplaces uh, safer in the first place, uh, which is key. Another one would be uh, FMLA, the Family and Medical uh, Leave Act, so we can actually access healthcare or or just simply rest it when we're injured and sick. So that's key. Um, and then lastly, uh, I think an, an obvious one, but it's, needs to be mentioned, is through collective bargaining, um, and this is more specific to the workers in those units, but uh, uh, access to health insurance. Um, Participation in employee-sponsored health plans for, collect, for, for unionized workers is about 84% access nominally to health insurance plans is, is higher than that. But I think 84% uh, is a good measure who actually participate compared to 54% um, who are non-union. Um, and of course, again, uh, this is a different model uh, in the United States compared to much of the rest of the labor movement around the world where here it was individual unions uh, with or with employers collectively bargaining uh, to and, and then unions union members winning health insurance for themselves and their coworkers. Um, whereas in, in a lot of Europe, a lot of the rest of the country, the world, um, uh, the model was to win health insurance for everyone. And then it really is the reason why we're having this discussion today uh, uh, around uh, Medicare for all. Um, so. The last point I'll make is, uh, of course, income is a huge determinant of health. Um, it's, it's one of the most important ones, or at least how you correlate health. Um, and so union members have uh, significantly higher wages than non-union counterparts. And the wages of people of color uh, and women see the biggest jump 
uh, relative to, to men or to, to white people. Um, so to, to shrink, not eliminate uh, is important, but uh, to reduce those differences. Um, so uh, that, that's another key point in, in uh, making sure that the population is healthy. So I'll leave it there. Thank you for that. You made some really good connections. And I think you covered a lot of ground on the many ways in which unions have increased um, health, maybe not so directly, but also indirectly. So if we're gonna move on to the next question, um, and you know, the title of this event is Labor Unions for a Healthy Cape Cod. And what we wanna do here as well is expand the definition of health a little more to consider the health of other sort of beings that we you know, share the planet with. So, and, and as a public health professional, the One Health framework is an up and coming framework that is becoming more and more often used um, in our field to think about these connections. And one of the um, and one of the key things is that we're not just looking at the, the, the connections between two domains, but also how they all come together. So sometimes um, poor environmental conditions can affect humans directly, but also indirectly through animal health. Viruses, epidemics, zoonotic diseases, so diseases that go from animals to human, are also a key part of this framework as they're responsible for bringing these domains together. COVID-19 is a prime example. And if this all sounds like eco-socialism, it beca it's because it is. Um, and so we're just trying to bring in, though, a little bit more of a focus, not on just environmental health, but also animal health as well. Um, next slide, please. So to use Cape Cod as a specific example, and but please bring in the examples that you know as well, the environmental health of cranberry bogs or the animal health of fish would impact the working lives of many families here. Beyond or including these examples, how does an unhealthy environmental and or animal world negatively affect working conditions or the economic safety of working class families? Chris, do you mind taking the lead on this one? Uh, I uh, will if so asked. Um, <laughs> I guess the, you know, the, the biggest way I look at that at this is um, recent scientific findings showing that air pollution is one of the leading worldwide killers um, of people of from all walks of life, but especially um, of people who are minorities um, or uh, depressed economically. And so um, I, I teach a class at, at the community college and we spent a lot of time this semester on this air quality issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, honestly, my students were shocked to know how many people die from cardiovascular disease, uh, respiratory disease, uh, due to breathing, uh, you know, fossil fuel, fuel fumes often. Um, and so this idea of transitioning to uh, electric vehicles or um, shutting down our fossil power plants or getting rid of the uh, flames in our basements with our boilers and furnaces or even the flames on our, our stoves uh, um, that are you know, gas-fired uh, heating sources and, and switching to uh, an electric heating source, all of those shifts in the direction of using green energy to provide clean electricity are also gonna improve our, our air quality both indoors and out. Um, and so any worker who is working in a, in a um, environment right now that has a heating system or a, a combustion source, um, people who work in uh, all kinds of manufacturing facilities, um, environmental quality improvements will work, will improve worker health and safety. And also they, they improve um, the environment that everybody lives in. And so um, there has been a lot of talk about the, what's called electrification. And that is switching over from fossil fuels to direct use of electricity. Um, if we don't change where our electricity comes from, we're not really making an advance. And that's where um, the importance of the Green New Deal and other policies that put renewable energy first as our first priority 
will make a big difference because if we're going to electrify our vehicles and our homes and our buildings and our industrial processes, we need to make sure as much of that energy as possible is coming from wind and solar. And if it does, then the uh, places that used to suffer from fossil power plant emissions will have an improved environment. Um, and anybody who lives along a roadway will uh, benefit from improved air quality. And of course, many of our highways uh, go through urban environments and impose incredible um, air quality and pollution burdens on depressed and minority communities. So um, this energy transition is, is really um, not just going to address climate change, but it's going to improve health for everybody. Thank you. Air quality, I think, is a really important example. Um, I used to live in London previously, and it was, you know, we would see the cases of fetuses having um, pollutants in, in, in their bloodstream. And so that's really concerning, um, you know, how, how much pollution can just affect us all. Johannes, do you mind taking on this question next? Sure. Um, I'll piggyback a little bit off of what, what Chris was saying. Um, I think that uh, um, with the transition um, to, to, to green, green infrastructure, uh, green energy, um, and making sure that those, again, it's not, uh, you know, a new, a new profit market uh, for capital, um, and that there's good union jobs, uh, that we build cooperatives, um, et cetera, uh, is key. Um, I, I point to some research that uh, from Robert Pollan from um, UMass Amherst. Um, who's been studying this for a while and just showing um, and rebutting a common narrative to say, you know, well, if we if we shut down the, the coal plants, you know, we're all going to we're going to lose all the jobs and we're never going to get them back. Uh, and the reality is that he's shown for every dollar that you would have put into the fossil fuel industry, um, if you put those dollars into whether it's solar power or offshore wind or whatever. Um, it's, it's much, much higher rates of job, uh, job creation. Um, so the idea that the transition is going to necessarily in uh, as, a, as, a, as a net calculation going to hurt workers is wrong. And we need to actually realize that this is, a, is an opportunity both for labor uh, and for the environment um, and, and for, for workers. So um, I would say that's, that's the first piece. Um, second is um, you know, we clearly uh, in a coastal community, uh, this is a fragile uh, ecosystem. Um, so we see how um, uh, the impacts um, of, of, of either uh, using, misusing our resources and not managing them, for example, in our fish stocks. Um, where the, the basically you had a worst case scenario where you, with let's say cod or other uh, fish, um, fisher, fishing families, fishermen and their families are, were pissed off because they were regulated uh, and they couldn't make a, a wage uh, to support their, their, support their families. Um, and if we had used other models, like I think there's a model in Australia uh, almost like a medallion, like a taxi cab system from before the gig economy destroyed that system too. Um, people were able to do both. Um, so there are alternatives available to us. Um, and then, well, you know what, I'll just leave it there for on this question. But I, I think it's a really nice uh, snapshot also that I just say the cranberry bogs, uh, th this idea or the fisheries um, is really to Cape Cod, so. Thank you. Lisa? Yeah, um, I honestly don't have much more to add to that because I think, you know, we we know climate change affects all working uh, working class families, affects us all. Um, that's just such an important reason for um, workers and, and the labor movement to, to be involved in that fight. Um, you know, uh, racial and environmental justice ha has come up. Um, you know, I think uh, We've seen, um, so I, so as mentioned earlier, I organize um, with um, auto workers in the, in the UAW as, as part of a caucus. And, um, you know, there are uh, many, um, you know, there are still many auto plants in, uh, in Michigan. Um, and uh, there are, as we know, there are also some very um, 
Uh, there are also um, severe environmental crises um, and uh, unions have a really important role to play in that fight um, because um, pollution, uh, you know, uh, for, especially for workers in manufacturing and, and resource extraction, they live in the same communities that are affected by pollution from these industries. Um, and uh, uh, for, for the next question, I was gonna talk a little bit more about um, what uh, the mine workers um, have, have been doing lately. Um, Do you wanna go straight into it? Oh, um, I don't wanna mess up the flow. <laughs> I was gonna call on you to answer the, the start of the next question. So go ahead. Yeah, well, I, yeah, no, I think it makes uh, a bit of a, yeah, I think it's a good transition because, um, you know, uh, we, we've been talking so much about how this fight leaves workers but behind, but they also have some very specific, um, you know, environmental uh, sort of uh, uh, reasons to get involved. Um, so I, I was going to talk about coal and then also a little bit about um, the, the auto sector as well, especially since um, electric vehicles have been brought up. Um, but, you know, coal miners um, engage in some of the most brutal fights for mm. labor rights. Um, you know, Johannes has mentioned all the things that labor movement has fought for. There's a very interesting Wikipedia page called List of Worker Deaths in the United States Labor Disputes. Um, and if you sort it by, you know, greatest number of casualties, many of those were um, incurred during fights for unionization um, in the coal mines. Um, so they've really, so we really owe workers in extractive industries um, and manufacturing quite a lot when it comes to the labor rights we, we take for granted today. Um, and, and coal is still actually a very well paying uh, job in, in West Virginia. Um, I looked up and it pays an average of 75,000 a year, you know, in, in a place like West Virginia. Um, and uh, many manufacturing jobs in the U.S. are, are still um, well paid. So, um, some of you, so you probably all know, um, a few weeks ago there was um, huge news when Joe Manchin, um, thanks to the efforts of, of DSA and other unions organizing for, for the PRO Act, um, flipped on his support for the PRO Act. Um, in that same press conference, he was with um, the president of the United Mine Workers of, of America, and um, he, um, they they both came out in in support of um, Biden's uh, plan for a uh, you know robust just you know transition to um, green energy, and along with that. Um, uh, it encompasses what's called, you know, a just transition for, for workers um, in these industries that would be uh, impacted. Um, and some of these policies include um, tax credits for subsidizing um, uh, solar panel and, and wind turbine uh, production, um, uh, support for miners who are losing their jobs through retraining, um, and uh, income support um, when they lose their wages, health insurance and pensions. Um, uh, most mine workers in, in that union are actually retirees. Um, and, then, uh, and then the thing that kind of linked it to the previous question, which I didn't know before was um, that uh, this plan would also fund the reclamation of abandoned mines that pose a risk to public health. Um, so this was like a big news day for you know, West Virginia and, um, and that industry and, and that union. So I, I just want to bring it up because it's such an important, uh, you know, and uh, this is going to um, having uh, the support from this union is, is going to be really key um, in, in getting the, um, the, the policies passed. Um, and then I, I don't want to speak for too long, but the last thing I'll say is um, similarly with the transition to electric uh, electric vehicle production, um, it is really important that the UAW and other relevant unions ha have a strong voice in this. Um, you know, it's not the limit, complete elimination of an industry, but um, electric vehicle production is less labor intensive. Um, so, you know, that means um, it requires somewhat fewer workers. Um, and, uh, you know, we want to make sure that um, we're not de industrializing. Um, in, in the way that we have in, in the 20th century that really like devastated so, so many places, you know, in the Midwest. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all I'll say about that. Great, thank you so much. That was really great, thank you. Um, Chris? Sure, um, so Lisa mentioned a couple ways in, uh, or pointed to advocacy as an important thing that um, labor unions can bring to the table. And I'm gonna give a, a couple examples that I've seen in Massachusetts. Um, 
the IBEW um, has been a strong supporter of um, more liberal policies for promoting solar power. Um, and their, their uh, support has evolved over time um, to, you know, initially it was a push to ensure that um, <clears throat> there were licensed electricians involved in solar projects. Um, and then the push was to um, increase the deployment and the subsidies available for solar projects so that the IBEW workers, um, you know, now that these were union jobs, uh, the ability, installing solar was creating and, and can create um, additional jobs for um, union workers. And as the industry has evolved, now the, a, a big push with projects is to go with um, community solar projects. And that's where um, we're headed in the future where the benefits of solar energy are democratized. It's not just solar uh, systems on the, on the homes of um, wealthy individuals who can afford to, to do this, um, but um, with the advocacy and support of unions, the solar industry is moving to make um, solar energy available to all, to all using different business models. And um, unfortunately, I haven't seen as far of a push toward um, cooperatives, which maybe Johannes could could mention um, and support and, and maybe give some ideas on how we can go in that direction. Um, but there is an effort through recent legislation and through advocacy to, to ensure that that solar is made available to all. And um, I've also seen in the last few years uh, in the offshore wind industry, um, as the industry tries to get off the ground, uh, the pipe fitters um, and other unions that are going to be deeply involved in construction of these projects have come out at and advocated on Cape Cod in support of projects um, at public hearings. And, um, you know, that shows that the, the unions recognize that this industry has the chance to lift up um, workers uh, at the local level. Um, I believe the two largest developers uh, that are first in line to develop offshore wind projects have um, essentially said these are going to be union shop projects. And so um, there's going to be a connection at the beginning of the US offshore wind industry between labor unions and um, putting out these uh, large scale uh, renewable energy projects that will provide um, a lot of the electricity that in the past would have come from uh, fossil plants. Um, I also noticed in the recent legislation uh, passed at the state level um, that as we go toward electrification, um, the legislation acknowledges that that's going to displace workers. It might be good for electricians, but it's not as good for pipe fitters um, and people who work with natural gas. And so um, there are provisions in the legislation to support uh, training programs to allow um, these unionized individuals to, to move in and interact across trades. Uh, and I think that's a very exciting development that um, in planning this energy transition, uh, the, the labor workforce is part and parcel of not just the advocacy, but the implementation. Thank you. I definitely heard a theme of a domino effect there where when we consider the impact of one, it definitely has impact on a lot of different workers and in a lot of different sectors and sometimes not so obvious ways where in one way we might be improving you know, the working conditions of one but might be deteriorating that of others. So that's definitely an interesting consideration and important one. Johannes, do you mind take closing us out on this question? Sure. Um... Uh, there, I do know one example. I think there are others, uh, but here in Massachusetts, there's a there's a cooperative named um, PV Squared, which is short for uh, Pioneer Valley Pho Photovoltaic Photovoltaics Cooperative. Um, they've been around a long time, mm -hmm. um, so uh, and I think a, a real great a great model. Um, and when I used to live out there, there was um, I would see them. They they came and talked to to a class that I, I took at UMass uh, about what they were doing. Um, a really a bright spot. Um, I would say I would, uh, a couple things. Um, one is that we we have a real battle uh, in our opportunity to, but one that we need to win in in framing uh, the the possibilities that we have here uh, because it's kind of the, the frontier of the of the of the economy. 
um, and how it's actually going to look, whether I know somebody just posted a question, if this is going to be, again, co-opted by, by capitalists, and is this always going to mean that basically the federal government, and it turns its spigot on when currently it looks like, okay, you know, capital in the state is willing to spend some money, um, but how much of that is going into the pockets of the, the owners um, via their corporations, how, many, how much of a slice of the pie are workers going to get? Um, so uh, as a reminder, uh, back in 2017, uh, when Trump came into office, uh, Trump invited the North American Building Trades Union, or kind of Federation of Unions, to the White House. Uh, and this is basically his way of saying that, you know, I stand with, you know, uh, with workers. And in particular, this, you know, this means a lot of uh, quality jobs from middle America. Um, and uh, on the premise or the promise that there would be a big infrastructure spending, uh, which would provide them jobs. And that never happened. Um, so we're, we're still in this moment where uh, it's key. Now, of course, we're... we're Biden and, and eco-socialism are two different camps, but nonetheless, um, for us to be realize that we're in this position of uh, who is going to deliver this and to say, you know, this was a false promise by our, our, the past president um, and on, from the grassroots level and, from, you know, people like us, like here in DSA, how are we going to push to to make sure that there is infrastructure spending to, to, to build a country, rebuild the country, um, and that there move, you know, we're putting that money towards cooperatives and unionized jobs. Um, the last piece uh, I will say uh, to, to talking about um, the environment uh, and, and, and labor, um, a key piece I think is the intersection with, with that housing plays, housing as a, as a solution both to our climate change crisis uh, and as well as our human uh, crisis around housing, and, and, and uh, Cape Cod is is an you know e uh, exemplar in in this uh, again because of our fragile ecosystem here and because of our crazy um, uh, rental and, and and housing markets. So uh, we have an opportunity again here to, and this is on the, on the Cape. We we don't really don't have a strong uh, labor. Uh, movement here on Cape Cod. Uh, this is something we really need to, to improve. But uh, building green housing that is uh, either affordable or cooperative or owned uh, by low-income people or a radical approach from the earlier 20th century, mid 20th century is public housing. Uh, we could do it again and we could do it green and we can make them into good jobs to build that. And we need millions and millions of, of housing units. Um, that are green because uh, the building process and then housing uh, energy use uh, is is massive part of our problem uh, in terms of uh, climate change um, and doing it in a developing in a way that doesn't mean uh, and I'll say developing whether it's our solar panels or uh, housing uh, not in ways that are uh, kind of sprawling uh, and, and destroying our uh, our green spaces um, but in a way that um, creates com connected communities um, and that reuses, uh, redevelops land in, in that was poorly developed in the past where we have tons of asphalt and uh, everybody lives a mile away from each other, et cetera. So again, I just pose this as more uh, opportunities, but we have to fight for the narrative and win it, so. Thank you. I love that you mentioned the housing connection because um, it's so key and sometimes forgotten and quite a challenge here on the Cape. It definitely adds a, a layer to this puzzle. So I'm going to move on to the last question here, um, which. So this year, the Cape is expected to implement the Vineyard Wind Project uh, and also receive a high load of tourists the, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, beyond or including these examples that impact fishermen and nurses, what are some issues that will affect unions on Cape Cod in the upcoming months? So another way of rephrasing this question is, if you can pick one, you know, climate um, union, climate labor issue that we can focus, that we should be focusing on and paying attention to this year, I think that's what we want to hear. And I really like what Lisa brought up, and all of you have touched on this, um, but Lisa mentioned the... Um, um, just transitions. And so I would love to hear more about 
you know, the issue that you highlight and how a just transitions framework will be key to ensuring both human health and environmental health through unions. Um, Lisa, do you wanna go first on this one? Yeah, um, so as you all know, I don't, I don't live on Cape Cod. Um, I live in the Boston area. You can use Boston, yeah. Okay, yeah, <laughs> for sure. sure. Um, um, so a uh, bit just specifically about uh, the impact on, of, of COVID um, or just on or just transitions more generally. Sorry, just asking to clarify. It can be more generally or specific to COVID or um, up to you. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, you know, uh, I, I've been, I was thinking about Cape Cod, and I was thinking about the hospitality industry, which is obviously everywhere, yes. especially yeah. important in, in Cape Cod. Um, and obviously that has been really devastated by COVID. Um, um, DSA has this um, national project, the restaurant organizing project. I don't know you all um, know about it. Um, we have a few people involved with it in, in Boston DSA, but it, it is really like this sort of, um, you know, uh, ambitious, very cool attempt to really mobilize workers in the hospitality industry um, where it's like quite difficult to organize because, um, you know, people are working in more isolated workspaces. There's divisions between the front of house, the back of house, a lot of linguistic and cultural barriers. Um, and uh, and then when people are, are laid off, when they've been unemployed for so long, it's even harder for unemployed workers to, um, you know, uh, get in touch with each other and, and organize. Um, so, you know, I was just thinking about, um, you know, the, the restaurant workers that, that I've met um, during COVID and how, you know, they really want to, um, in terms of like this theme of like transitioning, they really want to ha come back to different industry, basically. You know, it's not just about um, restoring those jobs, but also like making sure that um, these are actually good jobs because many restaurant jobs are, are really not, you know, for, for many reasons. Um, so uh, I don't know if that really answers the question, yes. but I think just like, you know, thinking about when, when restaurants and, and hotels and all these places reopen, how can we like actually, um, you know, use this whole experience of, of COVID and, and think about ways to um, uh, rebuild the industry in a, in a better way. Yes, thank you. I think touching on the hospitality, hospitality industry is super important given how important it is to the Cape economy um, and to many working lives here. I hear that you have to leave in a few minutes. So before we let you go, I just wanna thank you so much for your contribution today, Lisa. Um, I've learned quite a lot from you today and I hope that I get to see you in future events and future panels. Well, if there's you. anything you wanna say before you leave, please, this is your, your opportunity. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. This has been really fun, made me think a lot about, uh, you know, all these different topics. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know, I, I guess I just, um, you know, wish you all the best in, in, in organizing um, on the Cape, especially as, you know, we transition back into, um, yeah, as, as, as things open up again. So, so thanks again for, for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Chris? Can we switch over to you for this question? Um, sort of going back, you can answer it in this way, but also pick a, a topic this year that you know we th you think that we should focus on that has to do with unions and health. Um, well, I think it's you know the the question you know what are some issues that will affect unions on Cape Cod is is a is a hard question because there is not much union presence and um, mm -hmm. obviously workers are also getting squeezed out. And what we've seen is that, um, you know, not only is the, the cost of housing shooting through the roof um, since the pandemic began, um, but the, the, the work, the workers are, are and have been facing the most, um, you know, difficult and high risk situations, um, or they have been uh, shoved aside and, and work has disappeared. Um, and we're, I'm not quite sure we're in a spiral yet, um, but Cape Cod is pretty close to uh, completely losing um, a, a functional working class. And um, 
we've been importing more and more seasonal workers in the last couple of years that has um, option has been closed due to the pandemic. Um, but there aren't any workers around to pick up the pace. And so um, there is an incredible uh, disconnect between the incoming tide of money and people this summer and uh, the individuals are gonna, who are going to be able to hear you know, who are here and, and will be able to, or we be, will be called upon to provide services. And I'm, I'm very concerned that um, workers are gonna get overburdened even more so than usual. And with the absence mm -hmm. of labor, um, they're going to be working longer hours under worse conditions. And um, I don't have any solutions, but I have a, just this, this very broad concern that, um, the lack of a, of a labor presence and the lack of um, somebody fighting for workers um, and organizations fighting for workers has, has led us uh, on this path to, you know, recovery will be very difficult. Um, even if we build affordable housing, if the workers are already gone, um, you know, I don't know who's going to live there and, and will the demand for affordable housing keep up? Um, we're just in a very difficult situation and without policies that uh, address the needs of the working family, um, you know, Cape Cod's heart is being uh, dug out. How many fishermen are left? Uh, not so many, and that's due to environmental considerations, but also the cost of putting boat, a boat on the water and also um, being able to live here uh, makes things unaffordable. And, and um, you know, we're, we're at a tipping point. Thank you. I think you raised a really interesting or a really key point about the lack of the labor movement, um, a strong labor movement here on Cape Cod and how that it is an environmental concern um, as well as a concern for, um, for socialism. Johannes, do you wanna wrap us up? Sure. Uh, regarding the Vineyard, Vineyard Wind project, um, I think that there's a, a, a real need to uh, hold them accountable to make sure they do what they, they say they're going to do um, through either, you know, development or community benefit agreement um, to, to, uh, to fight for as much, you know, why would we trust them to say, oh, they're going to do everything in the interest of the community? They're not, right? So they're, there's fighting. We need to, we need to make sure that uh, we get as much as we can from it. Um, not least because this will be basically the baseline. We talked about it before as unions creating baselines in the economy for workers, for all workers. This will create a baseline uh, for these kinds of projects. And it's not, it's not gonna be the, the last one. Uh, there are gonna be many. Um, so I think that's an important project. Um, and again, uh, about seasonal workforce and uh, workers year round on Cape Cod. Uh, we are, is this a, really a crisis? I mean, uh, there are, there was a forum pre pandemic of in, in Falmouth of restaurant owners basically more or less and, see, and, and they said the housing, the housing issue is, is a problem for us because we don't have workers, right? So when, uh, you know, it's not Jeff Bezos, but we have local owners who are saying we don't have workers. You you know that that uh, that there's you have a huge issue, right? Um, and the other day, uh, uh, State Senator Sear said, you know, the market is not going to solve this problem, and and that is correct uh, because there's not going to be uh, housing that is going to be developed uh, that is going to uh, uh, work out, the financials aren't going to work out um, on Cape Cod for uh, low income work that is, is seasonal. So as a result, what we're seeing is uh, uh, busing workers in uh, for, you know, uh, for day work, basically. Um, so, uh, and then being bus back out. And this makes me think of when working at, uh, in California in Silicon Valley, that was a, it's the same kind of situation that has matured to such, such grotesque levels that we had people who were coming to Stanford or Santa Clara University to work as gardeners, custodians, uh, food service workers to make 18, 25, $30 an hour. But the closest they could live was two and a half hours away in the Central Valley. 
So they spent five hours a day traveling back and forth to work there. And, you know, they might have been able to afford a house for their family out in the Central Valley, but they were killing themselves to do this, to sacrifice for their family. Uh, and, uh, and even though the institutions said, like the restaurant owners maybe here on the Cape Cod, oh, this is such a big problem, they're not willing to pay it out of their own pockets unless somebody forces them to. Um, so uh, this problem is not going to go away. Um, this, this summer is, uh, is you know, just on the trend line. Um, so uh, one possibility, I think, is, a, is, is something to think about due to the lack of uh, uh, labor movement power on Cape Cod is the creation of a, a worker center. Um, I, I'm not familiar with many people doing anything quite so similar, but uh, I, I know that there's the Brazilian Worker Center, which is more based in Boston, but it has some members uh, on Cape Cod. Um, so just to um, recognize that other people are doing some, but, but there needs to be something uh, systemic that is uh, available, particularly for a contingent and seasonal workforce that is in and out to deal with uh, wage theft. Uh, unsafe working conditions, uh, supporting people who are want, interested in organizing, uh, doing education, et cetera. So that would be a great start. That would be a great start. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for the, the panel discussion today. I think the message is very clear here that strong unions is vital to making sure that environmental justice is not uncoupled from social justice. Um, and so now I just want to open up um, the opportunity for panelists to answer the questions from the chat. So I'm going to turn over to Alan, who has been monitoring um, what's been going on behind the scenes. Alan, do you have, are there, are there any, we, we do um, have a couple of any questions, questions that, that we can have for we, discussion? We, we do indeed, though, uh, to be fair, it, it's actually been Jackie who's been doing all the hard work behind oh, the scenes. Sorry. She, Thank you, Jackie. She hands me the information, which uh, we all need to give Jackie a big round of applause because this would not have happened uh, without her. So we have, uh, our first question is automation, artificial intelligence and the future of unions. Um, Chris, Johannes, what is your kind of take on, on these global trends, but specifically as they are uh, affecting the United States? and as they accelerate. Um, thank you. Please go ahead, Johannes. <laughs> okay, sure. I'll, I'll, uh, this is, I think, a really interesting uh, question. Uh, traditionally, I would say, or, or it's been usually the case that the labor movement, uh, whether the Luddites or, or others have been uh, against this kind of technological change um, automation. Um, certainly there's an issue of becoming more capital intensive. I talked earlier about the difference between green infrastructure jobs and fossil fuel in infrastructure jobs. And that is definitely one of those things where you have a, an old industry that's established that is a very capital intensive and, and not labor intensive. Whereas an emergent thing where you need to put solar panels up and it takes, uh, you know, boots and, and hands. Um, uh, but, but it's not that simple. Uh, and I think as uh, people fighting in the labor movement, as socialists, um, we shouldn't simply just shy away from, uh, from, from uh, automation um, or technology. And, uh, and this is my argument about why, is because it's all a question of who controls those technologies. Um, is automation, uh, deployed and for the benefit of Jeff Bezos, um, or is it, uh, you know, an, a radical example of, of cooperatives? Um, uh, so it, it's a tool. Um, and uh, I, I think that uh, I, something that really just opened my eyes a lot was, I think it was maybe two years now ago, uh, Jacobin Magazine did a, an issue basically around this issue. And, you know, like anything else, it's, it's, a, it's a future to win. Um, there is a lot of really boring uh, and unsafe and unsatisfying work that people toil in day after day after day um, that people would rather be doing stuff that's more creative. Um, so I don't see a reason why uh, we, we can't uh, move away from why do we need to, to 
to force people to, to have a meager existence to do something that is uh, just so mind numbing? Um, the answer is we don't, but, uh, but only if we can actually control it, if it's, if it's, um, if it's our tool, not capitalists. Um, I'll, I'll answer the question um, by looking at, at some of the green jobs that are um, coming down the pipeline and where a lot of the growth is, is going to be. And, and um, if you look at our, at our uh, emissions issues, um, essentially every single house and building has to be retrofit to a much tighter standard um, and needs new uh, heating and cooling systems. Um, and so all those jobs are um, humans doing work inside a building, um, fixing the building. Um, there's no automation possible that can uh, do a lot of this green energy transition. And so um, a lot of the um, work to advance these buildings is based on advanced technology and new understanding of how buildings operate and um, how construction needs to be to uh, stop air and leakage, um, while at the same time uh, ensuring that the bad air can get out so as to um, not create air quality problems. And uh, knowledge and technology are not intrinsically bad. I think Johanna said it right, they're just tools. Um, and a lot of this transition is gonna be about using um, human ingenuity and our hands and our minds, not automation uh, to, to drive down emissions. And so um, I'm gonna stay away from the broad topic, but I think that there is a lot of job opportunity and um, ability to uplift the workers uh, and everybody who lives in, in the buildings we need um, that have to be greener without depending on, um, you know, technology that could threaten uh, jobs in the future. I, I think that's a safe bet. That's a safe uh, stance there, Chris. That makes sense to me. Um, another question that we have is, um, how do we talk to those around us, neighbors, family members, et cetera, who don't necessarily understand the struggle of labor in general? And the question of the local economics in particular, um, an issue that's brought up is international J-1 workers visas. How do you talk about that with an out inviting scapegoating of the international labor? And are there specific statistics or talking points that either of you think of uh, when discussing these issues that don't give people the opportunity to bring up nativism or read about rhetoric about taking our jobs? Um, in other words, how do you how do you, how do we start taking this struggle, the narrative of this struggle, back away from uh, reactionary politics? I'll answer that that quickly, and I want to go back to um, Johannes's idea of a a worker center um, or a, a laborer center, a, a way for. Uh, workers to unite and have discussions um, and across industries and, and work together to build power. Most of the discussion about labor shortage um, is obviously driven by the, the businesses um, who are the capitalists who are making money on the backs of workers doing a lot of these jobs. And, and their concern is not about the lack of workers, it's their, their lack of ability to make profits. Um, and perhaps this provides uh, the working community some leverage if done right. Um, I don't have uh, specific solutions in mind, but I think the idea of um, convening workers from different fields who are essentially oppressed here on Cape Cod and, and part of the reason they can't afford to live here is because there's no ability or power to, to raise their uh, wages and, and raise their um, quality of, of work and quality of life. Um, you know, it, it, it may be that just starting these discussions across industries with workers involved is a, is a step in the right direction. Yeah, I, I think Chris, you're right. And um, uh, one of the barriers is because people aren't talking to each other. So I think that uh, the, the question was posed in a way, it's like, well, what if we don't have the kind of the right words, we don't have all the information, you know? And I think the key thing is to try to have the conversation and we do our best. Uh, and then not to, to shy away from not having the conversation because it could get tricky or could get twisted. Um, 
and yes, bringing bringing people together to to see their uh, common interests uh, as workers, regardless of uh, where people are from or what we look like. Um, I think that's also key um, to to show uh, in in uh, in any kind of unionization campaign or contract campaign. Uh, one of the key issues is you know agitating people around what their issues are. Um, so uh, whether you know it's housing and my low wages and you know I work in this restaurant, it's hot, it's unsafe, and my manager's an asshole, whatever. What do people care about and saying yes, you deserve to be dignified, you know, to have your your to be. Um, treated with respect and you deserve to have dignity um and um and to make it clear to everybody who's in part of this conversation about who's responsible for it um and and that's a key key point for uh people who are from the cape um maybe particularly if they're white if they're xenophobic or or racist um is to to make it clear uh well who is responsible for your conditions at work um, and it isn't it isn't J one visa holders. Um, it's employer. It's the how the state uh, allows your employer to treat you. Uh, it's your lack of a union. Um, I think that's the way to to reframe the the conversation. So that's what we call polarization. Um, and so to really make it clear, uh, you're on one side, and on your side is uh, is uh, your your coworker, whether from Cape Cod or coming from New Bedford or the J1 visa holder here for the summer. And on the other side is, is, you know, your, your owner or your boss or whoever. Um, and uh, we don't have to have use that, con those, those um, no, uh, phraseology in those conversations, but to, to make it clear about uh, who, who is oppressing you. Um, and if you have that conversation, I think workers, they know, right. They, they understand because they live it every day. Yeah, thank you both for um, for tackling that one so well. Um, our next question is is actually it's kind of riffing off something I said at the beginning, but I'm I'm interested in both of your opinions and if you know I, I can weigh in on what I I meant. But let's let's start with you guys. You're, you're you know they're here for you. Um, when I spoke earlier of preventing capitalists from co-oping and exploiting the Green New Deal. Uh, was I assuming that the investment of the green economy and the infrastructure would depend on public-private partnerships when public investment afford unionized workers better leverage uh, for the public-private partnerships and public subsidies of capital? So let me rephrase that to you guys. Um, do you, what are the dangers as you see them in terms of corporate exploitation of uh, a lot of the money that is going to get to get it, if the Green New Deal passes, right? We can expect a humongous amount of money to be shuffled through the government. And historically, whether it was the War on Terror, right? That's our most that's our most recent modern example, right? You have a huge corporate feeding frenzy onto getting into those funds. Um, what what do you guys think is is our best tactic to keep that from um, happening or at least to get the most benefits as we can as it happens it's a good question i'm chewing <laughs> chris anything pop into your mind on it my dog is uh having a barking jag so i'm going to sit out for a minute sure uh well i'll i'll, uh, I'll try my best um yeah, I, we we can uh, we a first step is to is to notice the difference in a, uh, between direct employment from the federal government uh, versus uh, through kind of uh, uh, the pri public private partnerships uh, through subsidies. Uh, it, I mean, it's a little little uh, policy wonky, but it but it is does matter about how the federal government is pumping money in. And so really our demand should be, and this couples well uh, with the you know, federal jobs program demand, is to say the federal government um, should uh, be the employer um, and they should be unionized as federal employees um, to, to rep basically replicate the WPA you know, or CC, uh, CCC, you know, in the Great Depression, um, that would 
provide workers with uh, the most power, uh, having a single employer, having uh, you know, arguably the most important employer um, uh, being the state. Um, uh, in lieu of that situation, um, uh, something like the uh, vineyard, wi uh, vineyard Wind Project of ensuring that when federal money goes to, to you know, to build, they want to, they put out a bid, we want uh, solar panels or whatever, uh, we don't want to raise, we want electrification, that who is hired uh, to do those projects, construction or whatever, maintenance, um, that those are union jobs. Um, that That's the second demand. Yeah, I think that, that uh, that's definitely what I would have responded to is this idea that um, when the government put puts money out, it can put conditions on, on where the money goes. And um, I've been really encouraged by the language in the, um, the recent state legislation, um, you know, requires a, a, a focus on environmental and social equity um, and economic equity and racial equity in um, pushing forward on climate solutions over the next decade and then into the, the decades beyond. And, um, you know, the the same words are being used in the American Jobs Plan that that Biden has put out. This idea that um, these programs are jobs programs; they're not, um, you know, corporate uh, grab programs. And I, going back to the recovery after um, the 2008 recession, um, I think it's fair to say that uh, the uh, Obama stimulus, um, some of that. The, those funds, a lot of those funds were hoovered up um, by uh, corporations and, and they did very well and workers were not uplifted. And uh, I would hope that Biden with a firsthand experience um, would be able to learn from, from that. And uh, he has the right people in place uh, that will make sure that this time things are different. Um, the idea of, of going back to the, the models that were used um, in the depression uh, I think is a fascinating one. I'd, I'd love to see something like that. Um, you know, we have these, um, you know, AmeriCorps programs and EnviroCorps programs. Um, they're not enough. Uh, those are, you know, sort of subsidized internships, uh, low paying, um, high hours. And, and we need to do better than that. If the government is going to be investing public funds um, in job creation, why not hold on to some of those jobs and make sure that the protections are, are put forward um, either by mandate uh, as the money goes out the door or the money doesn't go out the door through corporations. It comes directly from the government. So I, I think that those are the sort of arguments that, that labor and the environmental community um, I think are starting to make together and that just has to continue and, and the voices have to be stronger. Thanks for On that. that point, just I'll just add, I think uh, it's important. So the, some of the state and local aid that has already been passed um, uh, for Massachusetts, uh, I gotta fudge the numbers here, but something over the tune to maybe $6 billion or something is going to Massachusetts, uh, to the state and to, to municipalities. Um, maybe about a, a half a billion goes to Boston, to the Cape were, were uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. So um, in, in, uh, for municipal employees, for example, when, when our towns, so they will say, oh, we'll cry poor or the economic forecast, we're not really sure. So we can't give, uh, or, or private employers even, uh, nurses, uh, teachers, uh, raises, uh, who are these people who are barely holding on here uh, on Cape Cod as, as in fa you know, as family people? Uh, we have to, we also need to show up and say, no, uh, our towns, uh, there was a big influx of cash. Uh, it's not going to cover everything necessarily, the, their deficits, but uh, to reject layoffs, austerity, um, and um, uh, flatline wages for, for those public sector workers. Yeah, thank you for that, because that actually, this is great, because that dovetails right into our last question, um, which is, how could the community be brought in to support local workers and target abusive employers? I mean, um, John, as you just kind of even just touched on this, but um, what what is your guys' uh, vision for that? What would that look like? You know, if you had a wish list, I guess. Well, again, uh, a worker center would be good. I think uh, uh, I think building connections probably with the 
uh, Southeastern Massachusetts Labor Council um, to, for us to get a better, as an organization, a better understanding of, of what's going on uh, and building a relationship, building trust. Uh, um, it's, I don't think it is, it is no small task uh, to, to, to show up and, and to um, uh, make good on, on the promise of uh, solidarity, uh, particularly if you're a socialist organization. Um, so there will be skeptics, but that's not a, that's it's not a problem. Uh, we just have to do the work. Um, um, so um, the the one of the pluses about have you know kind of the worker center model is you you kind of um, you can connect to a lot of people uh, from a, a lot of different employers. The downside is that uh, it's hard to build concentrated power. Uh, and that would mean, you know, a, a unionization campaign targeting uh, specific employers. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not here to prescribe to say, okay, this is the employer that we need to go after um, right, right now. Um, uh, we should also be mindful of uh, whether there's any sort of kind of sectoral approach or sect uh, uh, strategy to how we do that, whether it's the tourism industry, uh, you know, including restaurants and hotels. Um, or whether it's uh, uh, building trades um, or which part of the economy that uh, can you build power in, who uh, it also helps when, when those people do have money um, going after employers who, uh, who aren't making big profits, um, it's hard to win much. So figuring out who has the money, who has the power and then go after them to get at least a slice of it is, is a good, uh, good strategy, I think. Yeah, I think that 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 uh, answer will suffice. Uh, I don't really have anything to add on the on the question, but I think um, building connections um, and figuring out how to get a success early um, is is really important to broaden uh, the base of support. Okay, thanks very much, Chris. Um, I think we're moved. I think that that wraps us up for audience questions. So Alan, um, you know, Chris and both John has have hit on the topic of connections. Can you provide some examples in which audience members can connect um, to the labor movement here in Cape Cod? Well, it's funny that you should ask because of course <laughs> I can. Um, what a great segue. So um, let, a let's- a plant. Well, yeah, exactly. Um, so let's- um, well, for example, as you probably everyone knows that this has been put together by the Cape Cod DSA via its labor committee. And um, we are always interested in participation. We are always interested in people coming around and asking us uh, who we are, what is socialism, um, what are we up to? And we're having information centers on what it is and what who we are and, and all of those questions. So that is gonna be dropped in the chat because we are continuing to evolve our participations. We are, in fact, this is the kind of first volley of um, our participation in the neighborhood as we ask the question, well, what exactly are we going to do and how are we going to do it? And so, everyone here can can participate in that that process so that would be awesome the other thing of course is that uh, national is focusing on the pro act and a little bit of statistics on the pro act because more than 650,000 calls and more than 1 million texts have been made to constituents of the last five democratic senators who have not signed on to the pro act and so far we've gotten two of them to flip um, agnes king He's an independent from Maine. And Senator Joe Manchin, he's a Democrat of West Virginia, they are now support the PRO Act where before they did not. So obviously we can reach more people, we can get this law passed with help, with assistance. So if you have phone banking or text banking experience, if you like the idea of doing it, um, we would love to have your input. We would love to have your help. Um, and then obviously the wonderful thing about joining an organization like the DSA, even if you just show up and ask some questions is uh, we are self-propelled. We are membership propelled. So if you have great ideas, uh, we wanna hear them and we wanna help you make those happen. So 
those are my two ideas right off the cuff. Thank you. Um, I think that one of the key aspects of you know socialism and political organizing is organizing in groups and joining a political group, um, whether it's joining a union or joining DSA or finding some sort of political home somewhere is, is very key um, for us to learn, to grow, to be challenged and to move forward. Um, so I just, it's with the deepest appreciation that we have had such illustrious panelists today. Lisa, Chris, Johannes, thank you so much for your time. I've learned quite a bit from your experience, which was really, really expansive. Um, I also wanna take the team, thank the labor group um, committee who, who helped put together this event. And um, remember, if there's one thing you can take away from today is that capitalism is evil. And with that, I wanna um, wish everyone a wonderful rest of your weekend. Yes, thank you all for coming so much. Thank you everyone.